Hi, everyone, and welcome to our Cloud Modernization for Oracle Database session today. My name is Celia Antonio, and I'm a data management engineer at Google. Hey, my name is Bjorn Ross. I'm a product manager in Cloud Databases. And I want to get us started with some of the trends that we see in the industry today. So obviously, most enterprises today are migrating their workloads to the public cloud. The other trend that we also see is Organizations are looking for cloud technologies and cloud automation tools to manage their workloads, obviously, in the public cloud, but also their on-premises workloads in hybrid cloud environments. And so modernization and transformation are a key role in every IT department's um, strategy from now going forward. And hey, Celia, maybe you can look into what does modernization and transformation look like for our customers in some more detail? Absolutely. And depending on who you are, transformation may mean something for different individuals. So if we're talking to developers, for example, transformation may mean simply infrastructure as code and DevOps and the idea of setting up CI CD pipelines. If we're talking to the head of an organization, they're really more focused on multi-cloud strategies and thinking about hybrid models. And if we are talking to the IT operations folks, they're really thinking about automation, especially when they're moving to cloud services. And they're looking for that self-managed type of service. They're also thinking about migrating for, in, when they're migrating to the cloud, migrating to more cloud native type of solutions. And how does that transformation happen? And the, the reality is that there are multiple journeys, there are multiple pathways to the cloud. And every one of our customer travels it differently. In the first journey, which is a typical lift and shift journey, is where you take your existing workload and you kind of move it to, and you move it as is to the cloud. Now, the good thing about that is that you do, you are in the cloud once you're done, but you haven't really transformed or modernized that workload. Yes, you get, you know, you can take advantage of the agility and the cost savings, but we haven't done a transformation per se. And then if you look at the middle of this slide, you'll see the shortest path is kind of the rebuild path. And that's where I, I take an on-premise workload and I completely rewrite it to take advantage of my cloud native services. Now that does look like the shortest path in this particular slide, but it is also the most complex, the more time consuming, and also possibly the most risky for our customers. And this is why we find that a lot of our customers instead are looking at more of a multi kind of phased approach. And that's what's represented by the yellow lines here in this slide. And in that multi phased approach, they either lift and shift as is to the cloud, and then they think about modernizing, or they start with on premise, they first modernize it, make it more cloud native or cloud friendly, and then they move it to the cloud in that cloud native format. So those are kind of the different paths that we see our customers take. And each, each customer will go through a different type of journey. So how does El Cairo Kubernetes operator help you with that modernization journey? Well, it gives you another option for that modernization journey. And what it is, is that it's an open source uh, Kubernetes platform um, um, uh, environment that gives you maximum portability. So it extends your Kubernetes environment to allow for database management. And it gives you automation capabilities as well. And it provides you provisioning um, capabilities so that you can uh, administer all the lifecycle management of that environment. Now, we at Google um, are very experienced in uh, being able to deliver services to billions of users. And we have we're very passionate about sharing our best practices with the community. And this is one such project that we are want, that we want to share with you. And speaking of containers, it's interesting to kind of think about the timeline between containers and Oracle multi-tenant. There's a couple of items in the slide which are or timelines in the slide which I find quite interesting. The first one being 2013 which happens to be the, the year that Oracle announced or created its multi-tenant container database. And at the same time, containers were also introduced. And in two years later, Google introduced the orchestration of those containers through their Kubernetes implementation. And then in 2020, 
Um, Oracle had been talking about removing uh, the ability to have single instance databases and only allow for multi-tenancy as, as the architecture going forward for Oracle. And in 2020, they did just that. 2020 was the first Oracle database in which only multi-tenant was supported. And that led us to think about Oracle in a containerized world. And that's why in 2021, we built El Cairo as the operator for Oracle on Kubernetes. And the last data point here that I want to highlight is um, October 2021, where Oracle cre um, created a support note, which indicated their willingness to support Oracle on Kubernetes. Okay, so let's talk about one particular customer, StubHub. Um, they moved their Oracle footprint into GCP. Uh, they were currently running their e-commerce platform on Oracle on-premise, and they were struggling with the agility and the cost of that platform. And they wanted to take advantage of the cloud to help them with those particular challenges. But they didn't want to move from Oracle directly into cloud native um, solutions. So instead, what they did was they took their Oracle environment, they lifted and shifted it first to GCP, and now they're really focusing on modernizing it um, into more of a cloud native solution. Bjorn, there, that's one use case, but there's other use cases I think that we want to dig into. So can you walk us through those? Yeah, thank you, Celia. So when we talk to customers that are interested in El Cairo and in modernizing with Kubernetes, I think there are three big, uh, big buckets of big use cases. So one is we have a bunch of customers that talk to us and uh, they're coming from a strategy where they are standardizing all of their infrastructure on Kubernetes. And so they have a desire to run everything they can on Kubernetes in the next couple of years. And that is um, th that gives them huge benefits for running applications and workloads, but it also poses some challenges and some questions in terms of if I run everything on Kubernetes, then how do I run my database and other stateful workloads on Kubernetes? And so for customers that are dedicated to a fully Kubernetes infrastructure, El Caro provides um, them with an opinionated way to do just that. And then the other two use cases that we see interest in is, uh, first of all, integration with test and CICD pipelines. So imagine you're writing PL SQL code or other database code, and you want to run unit testing for that. So with every check-in of your code, you want to run tests. Then what you have to do is you have to integrate that into your CICD pipeline, create a database, run your test, and then destroy it again for the next test. And El Caro and Kubernetes APIs work really, really well with those types of systems. And obviously, cloning databases is one of the user journeys that we support very natively. And in a similar use case, using similar tools, but it's a decided different use case, maybe what you want to do is you want to provide development databases to every developer on demand. Maybe you have five, six, seven different golden versions that you want to um, present in a self-serve way, well, building self-service portals on the Kubernetes API is super simple. And so that's another really, really good use case and fit for El Caro. Um, the features that support this um, support both provisioning and day two operations. So in terms of provisioning, we baked in what we consider best practices like SQL net encryption. We integrate with Kubernetes RBAC for security. We export your audit logs into um, into unmodifiable cloud logging. We have support for high availability where a custom probe will check for the liveliness of your, your database system. If it's not there, we'll restart what's necessary. Uh, but we also have day two operations. We make it easy to um, automate backups and restore operations. And we are soon releasing support for patching and updates. So you can just specify which new version of Oracle you want your database to be. And then we figure out how to get you from your current state to that new state. Um, I want to also draw a little bit of a parallel work on what you expand on what you what you explain with the timeline in terms of how does multi-tenant and Linux containers fit together. So if we think about the classic Oracle architecture, it um, consists of three pieces. Yeah, you have the database, you have the operating system, then you have underlying infrastructure. Um, but it's not always as clear who's responsible for what, because DBAs typically have a big overlap in the database, obviously, but also with the operating system. And that can cause some friction and some uncertainties in terms of who's responsible for what. Multi-tenant architecture already helped with half of this problem, right? A multi-tenant architecture, you break the database into two pieces, or more than two pieces, two components. The container database itself, which is owned and managed and operated by the DBA. And then you have this PDBs, which is what developers and applications actually interact with. And it's a much cleaner line of separation between these two things. Doesn't really solve the, the overlap in operating system yet. 
And I think this is where containers, so Docker and Kubernetes can really help. Because if you think about an architecture that uses both multi-tenant and Linux containers, now you really separate these three components out. So you still have the PDB, CDB separation that's provided by Oracle multi-tenant. But if we think of a DBA providing container images with the CDB installed, they can completely own that while a platform admin or a system administrator can implement company policies, networking policies, and abstract infrastructures to Kubernetes. Um, one other side note here is that the red part on the slide, so the CDB in the container operating system, can be thought of as kind of stateless, right? If you unplug and plug your PDBs that contain all of your, your application or your, your user data, then you could throw away your CDB, create a new one, and then just plug in a PDB into this, this new container. So it kind of becomes stateless and it fits very well into modern architectures. The one thing on this slide that is new compared to the other the two slides that I just presented is Kubernetes, right? So in, in this architecture, you now have to deal with Kubernetes and find a way for how does Kubernetes work together with these databases. And this is where I want to explain a little bit more about what Alcaro actually does and what it is and give you just a quick, quick intro to Kubernetes. So at a high level, what we do is we have an admin declaring what a database should look like. So they specify, I want a database of a certain version, certain size, memory, CPU, parameters, users, and all of those things. They declare this in a single configuration file, and they submit this to a Kubernetes API server, just like they would submit requests for any other Kubernetes resource. These APIs are defined in what we call a custom resource definition, and that's really just the definition of this object. Um, a controller, which is the actual piece that implements logic and automation, will listen for changes to these CRs, to these custom resources, and it will run control loops where it will check, does, the, does this already exist in my cluster or does it not? And if it doesn't exist or it doesn't exist to the specification that you either declared or updated, it will take the necessary steps to do that. And so what it does, for example, if you want to provision a database, is it will know that it needs to create at least two Pod, pods or containers, or one pod with two containers. Um, it needs to provision a bunch of persistent volumes through some, some way so that your data is not lost when a node is lost or a hard drive is lost. And it needs to expose services like IP addresses and, and, and ports to the outside world. And so it will actually do all of this for you. It will manage these containers, it will manage these pods, it will manage these PVs. Um, all for you so that you don't have to speak with these native Kubernetes objects directly. You just declare things to a CRD. And then applications and users, they will just talk to an IP endpoint, just like they would with any database running on bare metal or on VMs. And I did bring a small demo where I just show you what this declaration could look like and then how you can interact with Kubernetes to, to query the status of your, your database. So this is just an excerpt of, um, of one of these custom resources, right? So we specify something that we call an instance, that's the database instance. We give it a name, we specify the type, the version, which is 18C in this case. Um, we use Express Edition, and then the, the list goes on and on, right? We specify services that should run, but then there would be things like uh, which IP addresses should have access, what is the memory size, CPU size, et cetera. So the file is much longer. This is how we specify things in, in a YAML format. And once you're happy with your definition or you've changed it, you would then submit it to Kubernetes using kubectl apply. So that just tells you, uh, dear API server, I have a, a, a custom resource or an object that I would like to be stood up. And you submit that. And if you wait a few seconds or minutes uh, for the operator to actually reconcile things, you will, you will be able to query the status of this. So kubectl get instances is how you get the status of a database instance. And I want to point out that instances is not a native Kubernetes type. So if you run this on a vanilla Kubernetes, you will get an error because it would say, I have no idea what an instance is. But um, El Caro extends the, the vocabulary of Kubernetes by introducing things that are meaningful to DBAs. And then you get status like the name and the URL that you can connect to. And in this case, you see this instance has a single PDB attached to it, which is called PDB1, and it's ready to be used. So you can now log in using SQL Plus or your favorite JDBC driver to, uh, to connect to this, to this database. And that's the end of my demo. Thank you, Bjorn, for going through that demo with us. So just to kind of recap, El Cairo helps you modernize your Oracle databases um, by allowing the, you to run them on Kubernetes, by allowing you to integrate with CIDC platforms as well, and possibly build your own database as a service um, that you can leverage in your organization. And there are multiple ways that you can think about starting this journey. One is uh, we do have some labs, some quick labs that you can access 
that allows you to set up your own Oracle environment on Kubernetes. You can also find us on GitHub. This is an open source project. Feel, feel free to leverage that code. Feel free to collaborate with us. And lastly, feel free to contact us to get more information about El Cairo. Thank you so much for listening. Enjoy your day. Bye for now.